Yo, what's up guys? Alf here, and today we got a really big one to talk about. So, in this video, I've got two things to cover. First of all, I'm going to be going over the huge, huge card rebalance patch that's going to be going live later today. This one can't be overstated how impactful this one's going to be in Historic and Alchemy. So, I'm going to be breaking down these changes, talking about how it's likely to affect the format in both Historic and Alchemy. And then later today, Alchemy Eldrain is also going to be coming out. So, I'm going to be doing a set review for that set as well, and going through all the cards, talking about what I think they're likely to be doing in both Alchemy and Historic as well. Well, but let's start off with this one. The card rebalances, they're nerfing both Orcish Bowmasters and the One Ring, which is honestly pretty crazy. You know, the recent track record of Wizards in with the Alchemy rebalances has been that they're, they're really slow on acting on stuff that's kind of warping the format. And so to see these changes so quickly, I guess they were just waiting until Arena Championship 4 finished, but I'm so happy to see this. And honestly, this is going to have such a big impact in both formats. So let's start off with by far the biggest of the two, Orcish Bowmasters loses the Enter the Battlefield ability, which is, you know, not a huge change to the to the text of the card, but this is going to have such a big impact in both formats. So, what does this mean? So, first of all, this means that one toughness creatures are now playable again, which is absolutely huge in a number of ways. So, if we look at historic, you know, pre-Lord of the Rings and post-Lord of the Rings... Orcish Bowmasters being able to trade so favourably with one toughness creatures has just pushed out a bunch of decks from the format that were reliant on them. So I'm going to go, you know, highlight a few cards that are now going to be playable and also some decks that are also now going to be playable. So first of all, we've got stuff like Llanowar Elves and Elvish Mystic and Avacyn's Pilgrim as well. Now, I guess, you know, the, the green decks have been able to fight through this. We've seen with Devotion recently, with Delighted Halfling and Utopia Sprawl, those sorts of ramp strategies can still exist without Lanar Elves. But now that Bowmasters can no longer kill them on ETB, I think a ton of decks are going to be wanting to run these again. I think Devotion is going to be very interested in running these again because it means that they can run stuff like Old Growth Troll without having to worry about Delighted Halfling not being able to produce green mana. They can also just run as many one mana ramp options as they want now. You know, the recent Devotion builds, we've seen a lot of the decks having to either risk running Lana Werewolves into Bowmasters, or a lot of them are running Wolf or Haven, which is pretty nice alongside Utopia Sprawl, but I think Devotion is just going to be super interested in running as many one-mana options as it can before it even starts looking at the two-mana options. So again, I'm not sure what the exact configuration is. I still don't think Leyland of Abundance is going to be the correct option because Utopia Sprawl is by far and away the best one-mana option still. And also I think Leyland of Abundance is just is you know, really lowers the consistency of the deck, but I do think that the Green Devotion deck is going to start looking to run Lana Elves and Elvish Mystic again. Even outside of that, there are a bunch of other decks that would be interested in running this, you know, Yorgmoth and Samwise combo are both decks that did very well in the Arena Championship and also will be looking towards these again, you know, the, the uh, Samwise deck that I posted yesterday that was running Gilded Goose and Halfling, I think will be very interested in looking at stuff like Avacyn's Pilgrim and Lana Elves as well, particularly with Rope Line Attendant, you know, one of the issues with the like Halfling was that if you go Halfling on one, Rope Line Attendant on turn two, you can't then also play a one drop to make the most of the extra mana that you get there. And then, you know, there's a bunch of other decks that are interested in this. You know, Elves themselves have been basically unplayable because of Bowmasters, because they have to run Lunar Elves, they have to run Elvish Mystic, they have to run, well, they don't have to run, but they often run the uh, Leaf Crowned um, Visionary and the uh, Circle of Dreams Druid, all of which have one toughness. So that deck, even though Elves hasn't been that great in best of three, I've been wanting to build uh, Soul Cauldron Elves for a while. I think that could be a deck that has a lot of potential and that's just basically been completely unviable because of Bowmasters. So now that opens up again. So these sort of one mana dorks are now going to be playable again, which is a pretty big deal. The next up, we've got my old friend Crucius. So this card, I've in my mind, has just been unplayable since the Bow Masters nerf, you know, I have seen a few people run it and it still did look good when they were able to, you know, get a spot where they could get the first trigger. But now with Bowmasters gone, I think Crucius is just completely viable again. Now, obviously the nerf is still here, which does make it worse against aggro. You know, 3-1 obviously can't block very well at all. And it's also weak to uh, decks that rely on red, red removal. So against Wizards, their ability to just use, like, you know, play with fire to kill this is going to be very relevant as well. But this card has gone from basically unplayable to completely viable again. I think the Rakdos and Midrange decks will start running Crucius again because... Even though, you know, Wizards is likely to be popular now, I still think it's a really solid option. And, you know, just not trading s down so unfavorably with Bowmasters should mean that you're able to get the trigger very consistently on this because there aren't too many decks that rely on red base removal. And even then, you can kind of play around it a little bit by trying to pick your spots. So I definitely expect the mid-range decks to start running Crucius again, which then 
is pretty huge because then it opens up the ability for you to have access to tutor targets again like the old mid-range decks did as well so very happy to see Crucian. Well, I mean, some people probably don't like this card, but I'm, I'm a big fan of this card from deck building, so this is definitely another option that's become viable again. Then we've got Esper Sentinel, and by extension, Humans again. You know, I think Humans is another deck that was massively hosed by Bowmasters because Esper Sentinel and Thalia and Thalia's Lieutenant were all cards that were so integral to that deck's game plan, especially Esper Sentinel, right? I think the one-drop slot of the Humans deck is definitely the weakest, and a lot of the other good Humans to pad out the one-drop slot... Um, you know, such like you know, like recruitment officer, for example, were all unplayable because of Bowmasters. So I think Ors of Humans with Luris is suddenly viable again. I think Mardi Humans with Crucius is suddenly viable again. And you know, with Cavern of Souls coming out soon, we could be looking to run five color humans because we have unclaimed territory, we have a secluded courtyard, we have you know, Plaza of Heroes and stuff like that. So the mana base is going to be really good. So Humans is back on the menu again. And then even outside of Humans, obviously Esper Sentinel is a very generically powerful card. A lot of the artifact decks were running it. A lot of just white decks that wanted to tax the, the interactive decks were running it as well. So Esper Sentinel being back on the map is a, is a huge deal as well. I'm a big fan of this card. And then we also get some more fringe archetypes as well. Stuff like Merfolk, basically unviable because stuff like Hexcatcher just died straight to Bowmasters as well. And then on top of that, there's also just been, you know, any card that's come out since Bowmasters has been in either Alchemy or Historic, like Moria Marauder in Alchemy, for example. I'm not sure this card really makes the cut in Historic, unless you're trying to play, like, Devotion Goblins with Nykthos into Muxus, maybe, which is a cool idea. But, you know, any card like this with one toughness, maybe the Elusive Otter, which I'm not sure has a great home, but, like, you know, any card that has come out since Bowmasters with one toughness that we instantly dismissed because of Bowmasters now is worth a shot of trying, right? So that that's very exciting in and of itself. The other big thing about this nerf is that Orcish Bowmasters as a card has just become way less generically powerful, right? The the really sick thing about Bowmasters, even if the opponent's not playing one toughness creatures, which most of the decks weren't because Bowmasters existed in the format, it was just a generically powerful card because it was two bodies on a flash threat, and it's also very good at ambushing creatures in combat. So even if the opponent didn't have one toughness creatures, even if the opponent wasn't drawing, it was still a generically powerful card, which is why it saw play in so many main decks. Now without the ETV, I don't think there's any incentive to run this in the main deck anymore. I could still see it as a cyborg card, so a cyborg card against decks that are going to be drawing a lot as part of their game plan, but this not being in main decks because it's just not powerful enough anymore as just a generically strong threat, also means that decks that were drawing a lot as part of their game plan probably become more viable again. And honestly, I don't think this is going to be a strong enough sideboard card that decks that draw a lot are going to be punished from people running this in the sideboard that much, if that makes sense. So decks that do draw a lot, or cards that drew a lot, for example, suddenly become viable again, I think. So first one of these, Teferi Hero of Dominaria, and just blue-white control in general. So control decks in Historic shifted to blue-black for a couple of reasons. And, well, I mean, the two main reasons were both about Bowmasters, basically. So blue-white control was definitely the most popular deck, or the, the most popular build of control in Historic before Bowmasters. After Bowmasters... Everyone switched to blue-black, first of all because Teferi and the alternative Teferi, which is the One Ring, which is also getting hit. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but Teferi was just so bad into Bowmasters, right? You play you play your Teferi, you plus it, the opponent flashes in the Bowmasters, deals one damage to the Teferi, then triggers the Bowmasters again because you draw off that again, so... Blue-white control basically became unviable because Bowmasters was so good against your deck in general, but specifically because Teferi traded so poorly with the Bowmasters. And second of all, people switched to blue-black because they wanted to run Bowmasters themselves, right? Bowmasters is a really good tool against the aggro decks. Um, you know, specifically the worst matchup for the control decks was human. So shortly after um, Bowmasters came out, the control decks really wanted to have access to Bowmasters themselves because it enabled you to beat the, the decks like humans that had a lot of taxing effects. So with Bowmasters not being good itself, and with Teferi becoming a lot better, I really expect the control decks to start going back to blue-white again. I think blue-white is way, way more generically powerful, but it just traded so poorly with opposing Orcish Bowmasters. So I really expect Teferi to come back, which is a big deal as well, because I think that means that Divine Purge is also a card that you're now going to have to account for, which that alone is going to have a huge impact on, on how the metagame shakes out, I think. 
And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to, to try and build control again and see how it compares to previous versions. Uh, other cards that suddenly become really good again, Season Pyromancer, so one of the most generically powerful cards in the format, again, basically became unviable with the addition of Bowmasters. You know, a few decks ran out. I was running it in my Winota deck, for example. But now, I think the mid-range decks are really interested in running this card again. Super, super powerful through drop. And, you know, now that Bowmasters is probably not going to be run very much, you know. And the other thing is, if even if people do run Bowmasters in the sideboard, which they could very well bring against control I, I think bowmasters could still be a reasonable sideboard card against control we'll have to see how the loss of the etb affects its power as a sideboard card but if you're playing mid-range unless the deck is running season pyromancer and the one ring still i don't think people are likely to be boarding in bowmasters against you if it is a viable sideboard card so stuff like pyromancer gonna be viable again in mid-range could be viable in in other decks as well like madness or something like that which is a big deal then other decks like auras which haven't really been seeing much play i did see a little bit of a resurgence of it to fight against mono green devotion but you know that deck was always super risky to run because of bowmasters you know being able to kill spirit dancer on the first aura that you cast so now course spirit dancer and auras could suddenly become popular again you know more fringe decks that haven't really seen much play but probably would have done you know into bowmasters stuff like enchantress with sithis is worth another look because we recently got both utopia sprawl and phyrexian unlife so the lock in that deck is a lot more tight now you know as opposed to nine lives phyrexian unlife solemnity doesn't lose to drain effects like cauldron familiar like zulaport cutthroat which is really really relevant in the current matter as well so a deck like enchantress is now worth a look as well cards like faithless looting as well you know if, if you're a phoenix enjoyer is going to be potentially viable again um and then you know i, I still think shielded is likely to see play in the uh, mid-range decks but you know, you can run Lightning Axe, there's definitely ways to play around that, so Phoenix is a deck that could be worth a look in again, which I'm really excited about, you know, I haven't played Phoenix in a really long time, and I'm, I'm excited to try it again, and then obviously there's a bunch of other decks that could be interested in running Looting as well, if you're running a Graveyard Strategy, maybe Grease Fang is worth another look with Unearth in the format again as well, and then also again, there are some new cards that have been added to the format that draw cards as well, that haven't really been played too much, stuff like Up the Beanstalk is definitely going to be, you know, a card that I'm going to be trying to build around again, maybe in Devotion, maybe Maybe in leyline binding decks as well so you know orcish bone masters getting this nerf is going to completely open up the format to all of those decks that were viable before lord of the rings came out which is such a big deal i'm, I'm so excited to see how the metagame is going to change so bone masters is going to be huge and historic in terms of alchemy this is going to be an interesting one as well because alchemy has just been bone masters in the one ring so again i think the format is just going to get a complete reset even though alchemy is much lower power Unless the One Ring still sees a lot of play, I don't think Baymasters is going to see play in the main deck, which should, in and of itself, just open up the possibility for aggro decks again. Aggro really hasn't been viable in, in Alchemy recently, because purely because every deck is just running four copies of Baymasters, which is just so good against the aggro decks. Now, with the, the loss of the ETB, Baymasters just isn't good against aggro anymore. It's just a 1-1 with Flash when it enters. So, I think aggro is a potential option in Alchemy again, which is going to be really nice to get some variety in the format. It's not just all going to be mid-range piles anymore hopefully fingers crossed for that again one toughness creature is going to be viable again which definitely helps the aggro decks um so yeah i think alchemy is going to have a really big shake up because of this as well there are also some cards in alchemy that never saw play because they drew cards as well so very very excited to see i i honestly think alchemy could just completely shift with with new decks seeing play all the time as well again i'm going to talk about the one ring in a second i think the one ring could still potentially see play which might mean that bow masters is still needed as a sideboard card there potentially but we'll have to see i think it's going to have such a big impact in historic either way i think a ton of the you know previously viable decks are now worth a looking in historic again and then alchemy i think you know is basically a reset because bowmasters was such a big part of the format and then the other card that they're changing is the one ring and this is a really interesting change so they basically just made it one mana to activate which is a pretty big deal because it means if you play the one ring on curve on turn four or you know on turn three if you play it off uh, off some ramp you don't get to activate it the turn it comes down which is a pretty big deal i think this is going to be a big hit to the deck in historic specifically because the format is so much faster than alchemy i think there's still a fringe chance that some mid-range decks might be interested in this because the one ring just works so well in the mid-range shell right you fill your deck with a bunch of interaction and then just use the one ring to refuel to to draw into a bunch of stuff and run away with the game obviously still works very nicely with shield red but you know it can't be overstated how important the delay of setting the burden counters online is because you know the 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 sick thing about the ring was 
previously, you play it on four and you draw one straight away, then you're drawing two immediately afterwards, whereas now if you play the one ring on curve, you're only drawing one card the turn after, so the delay in the card advantage if you play this on curve is really, really, really big, and in a format as fast as Historic, I think that's going to make the card way less powerful. Again, if you run a very interactive heavy mid-range deck, I could still potentially see this seeing play there, but I really don't think you're going to see it elsewhere, right? There were a bunch of random other decks that were trying to run the one ring in their main deck, stuff like Devotion, and I just don't think it's likely to see play there anymore. So Historic, I think the one ring is basically going to be absent. Maybe it's still good in mid-range, because, you know, the other thing is, if you play it off curve, right, if you play it on turn 5, you can still get that burden counter immediately. Again, you have to use a mana every single turn to activate it, but once you already have access to 4 or 5 mana, that's not the biggest deal in the world, so... Again, I feel like mid-range could potentially be interested in it. I don't know whether control will be, to be honest. I still think Teferi is going to be much better. You know, even when the One Ring wasn't nerfed, I still feel like the One Ring wasn't the best control card in the world. In blue-black, I think it is because you don't have access to Teferi. But now with Teferi becoming a lot more viable, I generally think that it's much safer for control to run Teferi because you can immediately untap and defend your board. Whereas the big issue with the One Ring and stuff like blue-white control before was that... If you ever tap out for this and go shields down, you can get really punished for it. So, historic, mid-range potentially, but I don't really see this scene play any anywhere else. Apart from unless you're running like a Paradox Engine combo deck or something like that. Then in Alchemy, I think it's a little bit closer, right? This is definitely a big hit to the One Ring still in Alchemy. But the power, the, you know, the power level of the format is much lower. The, the format is a lot slower as well. So... I still think this could see play in Alchemy. Obviously, it's definitely a hit to the card, which I'm happy to see for sure, but my one concern about these two nerfs is that Bow Masters is just not going to see play in the main deck in Alchemy anymore, but I still think the One Ring could do in these sort of grindy mid-range decks. We'll have to see how it plays out. That would kind of suck if the format is just the One Ring, which is still really good, but you don't have as good answers to it anymore because Bow Masters isn't really seeing much play. But again, you know, I do think it's a reasonable hit to the card. The other thing with this in Alchemy is that Again, I think this specific nerf is good for aggro decks in the format because the big thing about the One Ring, if you're using it as a way to stabilize in a format like Alchemy's, <clears throat> you play it on turn four, you get the protection, you immediately draw a card, and the next turn you draw two. So, you know, before the opponent can actually deal damage to you, you've drawn three cards to potentially find an out to their board state. Whereas now, if you play this on curve and the opponent has a really aggressive board, you only draw one card the next turn. So you only have one look to find removal as opposed to three. Three. So I do think this, again, is a really nice nerf to try and enable the aggro decks in the format as well. Again, you know, obviously Alchemy is a, a lot lower power level, so could see play there for sure, but I do like the change, I do like the nerf for sure, and just overall I think these are really great changes, and I, I just think it's going to improve both Historic and Alchemy, so I'm so excited. And, and not only that, like, I don't want to understate how big of a change this is. This is going to completely shake up Historic. All those decks that were pushed out by the... the um, the, these cards entering the format, now going to be viable again. Any of the cards that came out since these cards were in the format that were one toughness or drew, drew cards are going to be viable now. And then in terms of alchemy, I honestly just think it opens up the format completely as well. So big shouts to Wizards on these changes. I'm so excited to get my hands on it. Speaking of new stuff in the format as well, we've got the Alchemy Eldraine set coming out later today as well. So let's just hop into the set review for that. And so starting off here with Dedicated Dollmaker, which is a really interesting card. I really like this one. So it's a 2 mana 2-2 two two, and it's kind of doing three different things. So first of all, at a base level, this is very good in a blink shell, right? If you're running a bunch of creatures with Enter the Battlefield abilities, this is very re reminiscent of Charming Prince. Now, you do lose the versatility of Charming Prince, you don't get the scry or the life gain, but this is doing a lot of other stuff that I think does make it better in certain decks, but if you're running just a bunch of ETB creatures, at a base level, you can just use this make a copy of whatever creature and just get the end of the battlefield ability again. The second and the most interesting thing about this card though is that it changes the types of the card that you exile. So the main thing here is that it turns whatever you exile into a token copy of it. So the first thing that came to mind for me in Alchemy was that you can use this to just keep looping three blind mice. So three blind mice, if you play this, on the second and third chapters, you can create a token that's a copy of target token you control. So if you play three blind mice and then you use Dedicated Dollmaker to exile it and make a token copy of it, you can then use three blind mice to make copies of itself, just repeatedly loop it over and over again, which seems like an incredibly powerful value engine, right? And it's it's pretty easy to set up. Dedicated Dollmaker also 
also works very nicely in token strategies because of the third ability that I'm going to talk about in a minute because you can protect your tokens as well. So I'm really excited to try this one out in Alchemy with Three Blind Mice. In Historic, there's also the potential of using it with Essica's Chariot, right? Because Essica's Chariot can make... Uh, copies of tokens that you control as well so if you had you know a token strategy in historic for example then you could potentially make a token copy of a really powerful permanent and then start copying it with chariot now having said that you know there hasn't been a, a the, the best token strategy in historic recently has been black white tokens i'm not really sure you'd want to run chariot and the other thing is that you'd need to have a very big powerful permanent that you'd want to copy for this to be good but this is definitely an interesting interaction and i'm going to try and trawl through the cards to see if i can find something viable here as well but mainly excited for this interaction in alchemy i do think this is a very very powerful engine if you can get it online then the other thing it does in changing the card types is you can change legendary permanents to non-legendary permanents and you can turn permanents into artifacts as well. Now, I've not trawled through the entire card files in Alchemy and Historic to try and find stuff, so definitely let me know in the comments if you can think of a combo that this enables, you know, because I could potentially see something where you turn a legendary creature into a non-legendary creature and then getting two legendary stuff alongside each other could potentially combo off. And similarly, they there, there definitely seems like they could be a combo where turning something that isn't an artifact into an artifact enables you to go infinite. Like I remember, Sahili Rai, you, you used to be able to make infinite uh, artifact copies of itself with Luxor a little while back, and then you would win with um, Reckless Fireweaver, I think. Now, again, that's kind of a janky combo, but I'm sure there is some stuff that changing the card types on that could enable some combos. So definitely let me know in the comments if you can think of anything like that. And then the third thing it does, kind of mentioned this already, but for a mana sync, you can give your tokens indestructible until the end of turn as well. Obviously, you, you only get to activate it once, but that was a lot of upside on one card. And like I said, I think the place I'm most excited to try this out is in a token shell in alchemy with three blind mice there are some other decent token enablers that we got in the format recently like pollen shield hair and you could use the real bunny corn as a payoff for going really wide with loads of tokens so this interaction definitely seems powerful in alchemy and i do think that there's a lot of combo potential with this card as well so i'm really excited to start brewing with this one uh, so next up we've got cerise slayer of fear which is a really interesting card very reminiscent of bane slayer angel uh, obviously it doesn't have flying but Five five, you know, five mana five five first strike lifelink is very very strong against aggro decks that don't have removal that can take it out. Right, if you're up against an aggro deck that doesn't have access to unconditional removal, like if they're not running go for the throat or they're not running ossification or something like that, this seems like a really solid option to just you know swing the life race back in your favor entirely. And then this also just starts producing a ton of card advantage as well. So I think if this is going to see play, it's probably going to be a sideboard card in white decks. Maybe you know white control decks in alchemy. This will be really nice against the aggro deck specifically and this is you know kind of a juiced up uh, you know version of the Bainstayer Angel effect because not only does it give you that lifelink swing that the Bainstayer Angel variants are so good at but it also just starts producing card advantage as well which is really really powerful so I definitely think this card is going to see play in alchemy sideboards in white decks against the aggro decks in terms of historic you know Bainstayer Angel has been run in the past only in the sideboard of control decks and I'm not sure that sort of effect really cuts it anymore you know the main aggro deck in the format right now is wizards and they have access to flame of an which can cleanly kill it now having said that we're obviously getting the bone master nerf so i do think that will lead to kind of a flood of other aggro decks in the format you know stuff like humans stuff like merfolk is going to stop seeing play again i think stuff like goblins as well potentially and so this could potentially, this sort of card could potentially see play in the sideboard to try and combat those sorts of decks. And getting some card advantage stapled onto this sort of effect is pretty nice. But again, I think, you know, it's been a while since these sort of cards have been viable and historic. So I'm not really sure it cuts it there, but I'm very excited to try this in the sideboard of some alchemy decks for sure. Uh, so next up we've got the Conundrum of Bowls, which is a really weird card name. The flavor's kind of cool on this one, but... I'm not really sure about this one, even in Alchemy, right? It's 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 a very good value card. So if the format does sort of devolve into very long grindy games, then I could see this one being good. But in terms of tempo, this card is just so, so slow. And honestly, with the recent changes to Bowmaster and the One Ring, I expect the format to become a lot more low to the ground, or at least I expect there to be more aggro decks, which this card seems really bad against. In Historic, I don't think this has any chance. In Alchemy, again, if the format does devolve into super grindy matchups, then this card might be reasonable but I just don't really see this one personally. Uh, so next up we've got Talion's Throne Guard, which is an interesting card. So this is a good tempo piece, right? It's a 4-mana 
flash creature that can either bounce something on the battlefield or on the stack, which is pretty nice. So it can be used as kind of like a pseudo counter spell. Uh, I'm not really sure how often the bargain is likely to come up on this one. I think I feel like if you're running this, it's going to be in a tempo deck, and I don't know whether the tempo decks are likely to have bargain enablers lying around. The bargain on this is pretty nice upside. You know, if the opponent taps out for a four drop when they have four mana, and you bounce it back to their hand and tax it, that kind of negates the downside of bouncing it back to the hand because then the opponent needs to find more mana to be able to cast what you bounce so if you can enable the bargain it will be pretty nice but i don't really think you want to be jumping through hoops to enable the bargain on this if you are just running a tempo deck i think the creature types on this are also pretty relevant mainly fairy obviously wizard is also another supported creature type but specifically in alchemy in my main uh, set review for wilds of eldrain i did like the the fairy support cards like spell stutter and the black removal spell but my main issue with those was I just didn't feel like there were enough fairies to support them. This is another playable fairy. I do think this is decent. My main issue with it, though, is that for those support cards to be good, I think you ideally want cheap fairies rather than this four mana one. And having said that, you know, tempo decks haven't really been a big part of alchemy at all recently, but I do think the format is likely to be shaken up with the you know, the, the nerfing of Baymasters and One Ring. So I'm definitely going to be trying it, see if it is good alongside the other fairy cards. Uh, in terms of historic, I just think this card is too slow and clunky. I, I really don't think this is likely to see play in historic. Again, I'm not 100% sure about this one in alchemy either, but I'm definitely going to be trying it out. It is a decent tempo tool. Uh, so next up, we've got Tome of Gadwick, which is a pretty interesting card. So this is a one mana artifact you can equip for one. And whenever you deal combat damage to a player with the equipped creature, you conjure a card from its spellbook. So we've got the spellbook up here, and it's essentially just full of cantrips, right? We've got Preordain, Ponder, Opt, Consider, Serum Visions, etc. Stuff like that. Thankfully, they they nerfed Bowmasters before putting this one in because these cards, especially Brainstorm, would have just been a joke into Bowmasters. But now with the Bowmasters nerf, this card is definitely worth you know a look at at least. And it is kind of reminiscent a little bit of uh, Curious Obsession, right? In the, the those sorts of style of tempo decks where. You know, you connect this to a flying creature, you start connecting with this early on, and you just start producing a bunch of card advantage, which is pretty nice. And the upside of this over Curious Obsession is it can be reused, right? You know, even if the creature that you equip it to dies, you can equip it again. So I think if this card does see play in Alchemy, it's likely to be alongside a bunch of cheap flyers. And I do think this card is powerful in that sort of shell, but again, you know, I'm not really sure how good that sort of deck is likely to be. There's still going to be a bunch of removal in the mid-range decks. I still expect mid-range to be strong in Alchemy. And, you know, if there's going to be any change in the format with the, the Bowmasters nerf and One Ring, I think people will be trying aggro again. And aggro is also pretty good against tempo. But I'm definitely going to be trying this out. It is kind of a nice tool that's similar to Curious Obsession, which has been pretty good in the past. In terms of historic, I just think this this is just too slow and underpowered, though. But I'm definitely going to be trying it out in Alchemy. Uh, so next up, we've got Dunbarrow Revivalist, which is another interesting card that's both a bargain enabler and a bargain payoff. So the main place I see this slotting into is in Beseech the Mirror deck. So even though the One Ring is getting nerfed, I still expect it to be a good card in Alchemy. And I still expect Beseech the Mirror decks to be decent because they can tutor the ring, but also be able to choose stuff like Shielded in the end as well. And this seems like a card that could slot into those sort of Beseech... Uh, mid-range decks because you're obviously going to be running a bunch of bargain enablers and this is a good payoff if you don't have your beseech but you do have stuff like hopeless nightmare right if you have hopeless nightmare or some other beseech uh, sorry some other bargain enablers lying around you can use this to bargain and get one of your creatures back from the graveyard like a, a lord skitterfang or a shielded for example which is pretty nice and it also gives you a bargain enabler of itself because you can play this on turn two get the boon then cast a three drop like lord skitterfang or something else give it the wicked roll and then you can use the wicked roll as a bargain enabler for beseech as well now it is a little bit awkward that you have to cast a creature to get the wicked roll right if this attached a wicked roll to itself i think it would probably be a slightly better bargain enabler because if you don't have you know for this to work with beseech on turn four you have to go revivalist on turn two into a creature on turn three to get the wicked roll so that you can cast beseech on turn four but i still think it's an interesting option in those beseech decks and i'm definitely going to be trying it out in terms of historic i just think it's too underpowered though we just have way better options in historic so i'm not sure this really makes the cut there uh, so next up we've got underbridge warlock which is kind of a weird card you you need a lot of you know specific things to really take advantage of this card right so you get the boon and if a bunch of creatures trade off in combat or you you know you, you're running a sacrifice style deck then you get to drain the opponent for five but before that happens you can repeatedly get value off this every single time which is pretty nice i think the best way you could probably utilize this is just you know playing it 
hoping the opponent doesn't have a removal spell for it, and then just getting the value off it every single turn. But in order to get the value off it, you really need to be running some graveyard synergies, which I'm not really sure there are many of in Historic right now anyway. So I think this card is doing a lot of things, but I just can't envision a shell that wants this sort of thing, right? Losing two life off the end step trigger is also risky against aggro. You need to have stuff to utilize the graveyard to make use of the mill. You can potentially mill yourself out if this keeps going on later in the game. And then the boon, I don't really get, you know, there's not really a sacrifice deck in alchemy either. So this seems like a card that's doing a lot of different things, but it's really hard to find a good home for it that would want all of these things. And I can't imagine it being just a good value card in and of itself because, you know, we've seen cards like Prosper Tonebound that are largely just better than this for value that barely saw any play, really. So I, I, I'm not really sure where this is likely to slot in. Definitely let me know in the comments if you've got a, a better idea for where this sort of card is likely to slot because this one's really confusing to me. I'm not really sure where it's supposed to slot. And then in Historic, I just think we have way, way better options for five mana. So very unlikely to see play there. Uh, so next up, we've got Air to Dragonfire, which is a really cool design. I really like the way this is set up. So this is essentially a two mana 2-2 two -two with fire breathing. So it has this ability where you can buff its power for each red mana that you have. And then you have this ability where you you can reveal it at instant speed for three mana and turn it into a 5-5 five, five flying dragon and then you can keep doing that over and over again to keep buffing it if you want. So I think the best home for this card is probably going to be in a deck that's playing at instant speed quite a lot, either in a tempo shell or a control shell because I think the way that I visualize seeing this card play out is you want to be playing at instant speed with counter spells and removal, then if the opponent doesn't do anything that you want to interact with, you can just reveal this from your hand to buff it and then as the game goes on and you get towards turn five for example, you can just pay two mana for a really big creature and still have three mana available to interact with the opponent so it you know it's a threat that you can put into play that's going to be big where you can still hold open interaction to protect it as well and then obviously the fire breathing allows you to close games out pretty quickly as well so if there is a good you know is it tempo or is it control deck i think this could be really nice as it is a decent finisher there as well now it's obviously quite vulnerable to different types of interaction right it does just die to go for the throat and stuff like that but you can obviously bring it back from the graveyard and it will retain all the buffs as well speaking of which, you know, I think in general, I, I'm not really sure about this card in Historic, to be honest, because it is a, a decent finisher in those sorts of decks. If you are running a lot of counter spells, then like I said, that sequence of holding open mana for interaction and then buffing this if the opponent doesn't do anything you want to stop, and then playing it for cheap as a way that you can just start closing the game out does seem powerful there as well and like you do obviously have Lurus where you can bring it back from the graveyard as well but then you need to be in in black probably or you know you know Jeskai if you want to be in white as well again obviously Historic is much much more powerful format with a lot of different types of interaction so I'm not 100% sure on this but I do think this one could have potential if like an is it control or tempo deck is viable so next up we've got Overcooked which is definitely one of my favorite cards in the format I think this card is sick in terms of flavor and I really love the effect it has as well so three mana enchantment players can't gain life is relevant against stuff like shieldred and obviously there are some you know fringe decks in historic that gain life like you know heliok and angels as well but specifically against shieldred that part's going to be very relevant and then you get this effect where you get a food at the beginning of each end step which is you know nice in certain decks that care about food and then if you've put two different permanents in play before you get that trigger you get a food fight instead which is essentially this enchantment from the main set where artifacts you control have two sack it it deals one damage to any target equal to one plus the number of permanents named food fight you control now this card wasn't very good as just a card you put in your deck but if you can get multiples of it off the overcooked this can stack up really quickly so in alchemy there are a decent number of cards that are good enablers for this you have stuff like charming scoundrel that can put a treasure token in play to just trigger this straight away i feel like you really do want to be able to make use of the food though unless you can consistently trigger the celebration each turn and the only deck in the format that really cares about food right now is the peregrine took confectioner combo and both of those combo pieces are already three drops and i think if you're going to go into jund for that deck you want to be running crucius over over Overcook, so I'm not really sure this one sees play there to be honest, but there could potentially be a celebration deck um, with treasure synergies for example like charming scoundrel where you run this you run a bunch of celebration enablers you can run the other celebration three drop creature payoff as well and then just use your treasures as a way to close the game out with your food fights that's probably the home that i see the most in in alchemy but i love the design on this card i'm definitely going to be trying it in a bunch of different shells in alchemy in historic the the home i'm most excited to try this one out is in only cult anvil i think this card is really really sick in the only cult anvil shell because you obviously have a ton of artifacts in that deck it's very easy 
for you to produce a bunch, you know, get two permanents in play the same turn. Um, you can, you know, obviously turn all of your anvil tokens into stuff that you can sack to deal a bunch of damage. Now, my main concern with that sort of deck is that you do cut yourself off the life gain of only Cult Anvil, which is a nice upside of the anvil itself. And additionally, you know, I think that deck, the, well, the issue with that deck in the current metagame is it's pretty weak to both control, especially if Divine Purge starts seeing more play, and against the combo deck. So maybe if you can fit a bunch of discard spells into your 75, it could be good. But either way, I love the design on this card, and I'm definitely going to be trying it out in both formats to see if it works. Uh, so next up, we've got Victory of the Pyro Hammer, which is an interesting card, right? You deal you know, four to each creature in Planeswalker on the first mode, and then you get this ability that we've seen on some other cards where damage isn't removed from creatures during cleanup steps that we've seen on stuff like Melt Through and Unveiled Fury, for example. Now, on this card... We do lose that ability when the Saga removes from the battlefield. Unlike Unveiled Fury that sticks around for the entire game as long as it's on the battlefield, you do lose this damage isn't removed as soon as you hit the third chapter because the Saga just disappears again. So it doesn't stick around for good, but you are th there aren't any Red Sweepers in Alchemy right now that can deal with bigger creatures, right? If you're using Red Sweepers to deal with smaller creatures, I think Brotherhood's End is by far the better option. But if you're a red deck that needs to be able to kill Shield Red and a bunch of other creatures, this does seem like the only option. Now, the obvious big downside of this card, if you want to use it to kill Shield Red, is it only deals four damage off the first chapter. So you need to wait a turn before it deals that extra damage to be able to kill the Shield Red. And I'm not really sure what sort of deck would want to run this. You know, there aren't very many controlling red decks in the format right now. So this is an interesting card that if you are a red deck that wants to be able to sweep the board and kill Shield Red is basically your only option. But it's not a very efficient way to do it. So I'm not really sure what decks would be interested in this. And then again, in Historic, we just have way, way better options than this. So don't expect it to see play there. Uh, so next up, we've got Draconic Debut, which is a really cool card. I like the design on this one. So it's essentially a fireball, you know, red X, deal X damage to any target that also reduces the cost of the next dragon spell you cast. And unlike similar effects that we've seen of this in the past, the dragon spell doesn't need to be in your hand. You get to, you know... That basically sticks around until you just draw your next dragon spell, which is pretty nice because it means that you don't really have to have that many high density of dragons in your deck. You know, with similar effects that we've seen like Fearsome Welt that does care about your hand, you really needed to rely on a high density of dragons in your deck to benefit from that. With this card, I don't really think you need to. And the floor of the card isn't that low either, right? Fireball, while not that good even in alchemy is still not a horrendous card and if you are running some dragons alongside it then i think this is a decent card in those sorts of decks now there are a decent amount of dragon support still in the format if you did want to go more heavily in the build around direction on this we've got stuff like invasion of tarkir which i think is incredibly strong if you are running a lot more dragons you got stuff like daragaz as well if you're going to go into black and then i think just a generically powerful card that pairs very well with the uh, draconic debut is shivan devastator right Reducing the cost of this means that you can deal a ton of damage when it comes down. And then if you're also using your Draconic Debut to go face, this represents a lot of burn damage. But like I said, I think the nice thing about this card is you don't need to go too heavily into the Dragon Synergies. As long as you have some in the deck, you'll be able to benefit off the extra bonus of this card when you do draw your dragon as well. So this is a very cool design. I'm definitely going to be trying it out in Alchemy. In Historic, Dragons have not been a playable deck ever really and you know fireball has not really been a playable card ever either so i don't think it makes the cut there but i'm definitely gonna be trying this one out in alchemy uh, so next up we've got a golden opportunity which is a you know a cool card flavor wise but i think this card is just pretty terrible honestly so you pay three mana and on chapter one you get a gilded goose and then you can also get you know golden eggs in play which do produce card advantage and, and also give you some food on the other chapters but my big issue with this card is that if the opponent kills the gilded goose this just does nothing, right? You you pay three mana for Gilded Goose, the opponent kills it, and then chapter two and three does nothing, unless you happen to also be running other birds in your deck. Now, obviously, if the Gilded Goose survives, then you essentially get, you know, two golden eggs to draw you two cards, but even then, a Goose and drawing two cards doesn't seem very good. I can't really think of a good deck to slot into. If you're running a deck that happens to be running artifacts and birds as well, then I can see the value of this, but I just think this card is way too vulnerable to removal on the Goose for it to be good. And then in Historic, where you can also run Gilded Goose, this card just seems way, way, way too slow. So I, I really don't expect this one to see play at all, to be honest. Uh, so next up, we've got Hex Kaladin's Companion, which is another nice payoff if you're playing Adventures. Now, obviously, Adventures hasn't been a deck at all in Alchemy so far, but with the nerf of Orcish Bowmasters and the One Ring, I am hoping that opens up the format a little bit more for other archetypes to potentially shine. And there are a decent number of good Adventures in the format. I think, you know, specifically Baluna Grand Squall is a really nice payoff if you are running Adventures. So if an Adventures deck is viable in 
in the format and we are getting some other adventure cards later in this set that I'm going to talk about as well. This does seem like a pretty reasonable payoff. Now, the awkward thing about this one is that it doesn't really do much early on, right? You play it on turn two, you can maybe attack him with it and then as you cast adventures, it does get buffed and then comes back later in the game. So I don't think the ceiling on this card is very high, right? I think, you know, Typically, you'd probably be happy if this comes back as like a 4-4 or a 5-5 with haste, but for two mana, that's a pretty good rate. So I do think if an adventures deck is good, that this could be a really nice payoff in addition to that as like a way to apply pressure in the late game that you can also protect, you know, by casting adventures at instant speed. Potentially the fact that you can sort of exile and phase this out whenever you cast an adventure to protect it is pretty nice as well. So I think this is an interesting design. And if an adventures deck is viable in alchemy i definitely expect this one to see play um but again whether an adventure deck is good is is the big question to be answered right in terms of historic you obviously have more tools for the adventure deck you have the original eldrain busted ones like bone crusher giant and and stuff like that and obviously have lucky clover and edgewall innkeeper as well which is now going to be viable again after the bone masters nerf but you know even before uh, Teamer Adventures hasn't been a, a good deck in Historic for a while. We obviously did get a, a new influx of adventures with Wilds of Eldrain, but I don't think many of them are really Historic playable, so I, I would be surprised if Historic Adventures is a deck. And I think if Historic Adventures is a deck, the adventure cards themselves will be carrying the deck. I don't think you would really be interested in Hex itself. So this one I'll be trying out on Alchemy, but I don't expect it to make the cut in Historic. Uh, so next up we've got Swine Rebellion, which is the first card we're going to look at in the kind of Boar Synergies card that we're getting in this set, which is not a phrase I expected to say, but this is kind of a cool card. Three mana sorcery, and if we control three or more boards with different names, we conjure each of the three pigs onto the battlefield, but I'll show you in a second. If that's not the case, which I think will be in most situations, if you control two or fewer boards, you get two out of the three pigs one of them goes into your hand and one of them goes onto your battlefield. So at its floor, you get to pick two of the pigs, one in play, one in your hand. So the, the pigs, for those of you who haven't seen, first little pig is two mana, two, two, that you can exile target artifact or enchantment once, which is very relevant against the one ring if that still sees a lot of play. But obviously there's another bunch, th there's going to be other artifacts or enchantments that are run in the deck. So when we have these cards that can conjure the pigs, this is a very nice utility card to get if there is a problematic artifact or enchantment in play. Then the second pig is a very nice mana sync if the game is going long right if you do happen to top deck the swine rebellion later in the game and you have access to a bunch of mana you might want to just put the second pig in play activate it immediately so that you can turn it into a much bigger creature and then the third pig is also a card that gets a bunch of value as you're conjuring stuff so all of the synergies that conjure these pigs obviously buff this so i think if you get one of these cards down early this is a good one to pick and then it also gets the bonuses from the graveyard so if you have some graveyard recursion in the deck this can be just a generically big creature as well so i think this is one of the ones where if you get your conjure synergies online in the early game this is going to grow pretty big so it's hard to say whether you would want to be running these cards in the main deck because these aren't just spellbook cards. These are actual cards that are going to be in the set. So you can put these cards in your main deck if you want. And obviously the big bonus you can get here is if you have all three of them in play, you get another three, which is pretty sick. But since they all need to have different names and there aren't many other boards in, in Alchemy right now that are actually good, there are a couple that are legal, but I don't really think your main goal with this card should be to try and have three in play because i think that's going to be so hard to set up so it's hard to say whether you would actually want to run these cards in the main deck or whether it's better to just run the more value cards like swine rebellion to just conjure these when you get them because the nice thing about these cards specifically the the first little pick and the second one is that they're very good in certain spots, right? You don't really want to be drawing this against decks that don't have artifacts and enchantments. So it could be the case that you just want to be running these cards that conjure them instead. Uh, another one that I think is incredibly strong is Porcine Portent, which is basically an adventure card where the instant side is just good on its own, right? So three mana, exile target creature, and you also get a bonus if you have boars in play. But even without the boars, I think this is just a good mid-range card. Three mana to exile a creature, is premium removal in alchemy right there's not any other cards that do that effect if you're interested in exile for this cheap obviously you have stuff like go for the throat but the fact that this can kill artifacts and it exiles as well is particularly relevant and then you also get you know the the uh the other side of it as well so four mana enchantment you get to conjure one of the pigs onto the battlefield and then you also get an anthem effect as well so this is obviously going to be insanely good in the uh if, if you're building more heavily around the boar synergies right if you are running this maybe if you do end up running some of these in the main deck as well 
this is going to be really good as an anthem effect that also helps conjure whatever pig is most relevant. But the fact that this, you know, the the, the lender ham side, which is a great pun, by the way, love the design on some of these, is just really good on rate anyway for a three mana piece of interaction. I think this card is just going to be good in white black mid range as well, alongside stuff like, you know, potentially Juggernaut Peddler and whatever other white black cards you want to run in, in that sort of deck. And then we also have a final payoff for this sort of thing, Drover of the Swine. And when it enters the battlefield, you can either conjure one of the pigs onto the battlefield, or you can return up to three boards from your graveyard. So that's obviously going to be particularly nice with the third little pig. That's going to be a nice interaction there. If you do lean more heavily into these, there's also kind of, you know, a meme with this in, in history where there are you know expensive boards like Endray's Forerunners and Ilhag for example so you could potentially use this in Historic as a way to reanimate those but that's just a meme I, I very much doubt that deck is going to be good when Priest of Fell Rites reanimating on turn three often isn't good enough so having a five mana reanimate thing is not going to make the cut there but you know maybe that's a funny meme deck if you wanted to try and reanimate a bunch of uh, expensive boards from the graveyard in terms of alchemy I think if you're just using this to conjure one of the pigs in play, it's not that strong. But if you do have the potential to reanimate a bunch of stuff from the graveyard, particularly if you do get one like the, the third pig in your graveyard early on, this could be nice. So I'm not as optimistic about this one, but I think the Porcine Portent and the Swine Rebellion are decent on their own, particularly the Porcine Portent though. I think this one is definitely going to see play, even if you don't care about the boss synergies at all. And then in terms of Historic, I just don't think these ones are going to see play. I mean, Porcine Portent isn't too far off from being playable but three mana single target removal in historic isn't the best and you obviously need to be in black white which isn't really a mid-range deck either so again i'm definitely gonna be trying these ones out in alchemy not not sure they make the cut in historic though uh, so next up we have accident prone apprentice which i think is one of the strongest cards in the set so this is a really powerful card in like an is it spell slinger deck the instant side being able to turn any creature into a one one is very good because is it decks you know typically rely on red damage base removal as their main way to take creatures out and that makes them naturally weak to creatures with bigger stats so being able to shrink something down and then kill it with a burn spell is really powerful and then it also gets perpetual plus one plus one for each non-creature spell you cast either when it's on the battlefield or when it's in exile before you cast it as well so if there's an is it spell slinger deck in alchemy this is definitely going to be running that for sure in terms of historic i think there is a conversation to be had about this in the wizards deck because it is a wizard now having said that the, the awkward thing about wizards right now and why the deck is so good is because it's so fast game one you can outrace the uninteractive decks like devotion and because you have a lot of burn spells you can also slow down the the creature based combo decks like yorgmoth and kethis and samwise and race them as well the issue with this there is that I don't think this card really fits into that game plan very well because if you start cutting stuff like Balmore and Reckless Charge in order to run more value stuff then you start to lose percentage points against Devotion and, and the creature based combo decks which is its real strength. Having said that the big weakness of Wizards as a deck is against the interactive decks and I think running cards like this could give you a way to grind better against those interactive decks because it gives you more ways to kill shielded and stuff. Obviously the adventure cards are inherent to for ones in most cases as well so maybe i could see it if you wanted to pivot the deck to improve your matchups more you know better against the the mid-range and interactive decks but the main reason why i'm not really sure this is going to make the cut in historic is just because the big advantage of it is being able to you know shrink stuff like shieldred but wizards doesn't really need to do that anymore because of flame of an right flame of an can kill the vast majority of creatures that it used to struggle against so i'm not really sure that the benefit that the instant side of this provides really warrants a slot but i'm going to be testing it out to see either way uh, then next up we've got grow old together which is a you know a cool design but I just don't think it really has a good home. The only home I can really think of that might want this is, you know, maybe a Simic Flash deck with a lot of creatures that wants to be playing at instant speed to be able to grab your Flash creatures and buff them slightly. You could also run it alongside Collected Company. I think you can afford to run eight non-creature spells in your creature heavy deck but again i just can't really think of a deck that this slots very well into so it's an interesting card that i've got on my radar but i'm not really sure it has a good home yet uh, so next up we've got high fey prankster which is a pretty unique effect that you can use to kind of you know swap creatures power around which is a pretty interesting effect but I just don't think this card is, is high impact enough. It, having Flying and Death Touch are very relevant keywords, and it is also another fairy, and it's a rogue as well. You know, I feel like fairies and rogues are both archetypes where they want to get more, you know, depth in their creature options, but <clears throat> I think both of those 
creature types really want to have cheaper options and obviously four mana is pretty expensive so I think this is a cool effect. Maybe there's some combo potential, so if you can think of a combo with this card, definitely let me know in the comments, but unless there is a good combo, I'm really not sure this one is better than the other options that we have in the format, even in Alchemy. Uh, so next up, we've got Jewel Mine Overseer, which is one of my favorite designs in this set. I really like this one. So when it enters the battlefield, you conjure seven, seven dwarves on top of your library. They perpetually gain when it enters the battlefield, draw a card, and then you shuffle. So kind of reminiscent of Oracle of the Alpha, except you're putting seven reasonable cards in your deck rather than like, you know, two or three really good ones and then a bunch of bricks, which is a very big difference. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library, you may play that card this turn. So if you, if you don't know what Seven Dwarves is, it's essentially a two mana two two that gets plus one plus one for each other Seven Dwarves you control. So like I said, getting a two mana two two that draws on ETB and then gets buffed as you get more of them in play is way better than drawing Moxes off the Oracle of the Alpha. So you're actually putting reasonable cards in your deck which is good in, in alchemy. In historic, it might be a little bit clunky, you know, having to spend two mana on a 2-2 card that draws you a card, but, you know, I, I still think this could potentially see play in historic, mainly because of the second ability alongside PNLR. So the place I'm most excited to try this in is alongside PNLR because you get this card advantage every single turn that is, you know, exiling. So it's sort of like this reckless impulse style effect every single turn. And that pairs perfectly with PNLR, which is legal in alchemy and also I think is decent in historic because you can pair it with Retrofit, a Foundry, and there's a bunch of other cards that work really well with it, like Lelia and a bunch of other of those reckless impulse style effects. So I'm really excited to try this one out alongside PNLR. There's also Questing Druid if you can if you can afford to go into Naya. Obviously the mana base in alchemy is pretty rough right now after rotation but questing druid also works very very well with pnlr so i'm very very excited to try this one in alchemy i think it's going to be very strong alongside pia and i have also had decent success with pnlr decks in historic as well and i'm definitely going to be trying it out there as well now having said that i think the seven dwarf has become closer to a brick in historic where every deck is racing so quickly but i'm still going to try it there because the ability to get this card advantage every single turn is very powerful even though it is a little bit more vulnerable to interaction uh, so next so we've got Outfitted Jouster, which is essentially a 4-mana 6-6 six, six with Trample, I believe. So when it enters the battlefield, you get a Steel Claw Lance, which I believe is an equipment that just gives you 2-2, two, two, which is slightly easier to equip to Knight. And then you also get Brawler's Plate, which I believe also gives 2-2 two, two and Trample. So 4-mana for a 6-6 six, six Trample, it is reasonable stats, and then you can prevent damage and sack the equipment attached to it. So it's an interesting card, but it's just not a particularly exciting one for me. It essentially just looks like a bunch of stats. Obviously, getting the equipment is a bonus because then if it does die to removal, you still have the equipment lying around to attach to other creatures, but it doesn't seem particularly high impact. And again, I'm not really sure there's a good home for it either. It, I think if you're just running it as a value card in the mid-range deck, there are generally just better options in the format. So it's an interesting card, but I just can't really think of a good home for it. Uh, so next up we've got Steady Tortoise, which is one of my favourite cards in this set as well. The, like, the flavour on this is great, and I actually think the card is pretty decent as well. So you get a 1-1 one, one, uh, token with haste off the sorcery side, and then whenever you attack, it perpetually gets plus 1, plus 1, even when it's in exile. So if you are running it like a token strategy, an aggressive token strategy, by the time you cast this on turn 5 or whenever you reach your 5th mana, you do get a pretty beast, uh, you know, a, a big creature, and it also gets Ward 2 as well. So the main reason I'm excited for this one is, first of all, there are a decent amount of token synergies in the format right now. I think Pollen Shield Harry is a really big one, especially if you're leaning into the adventure side of things, right? I think there are a decent number of good adventure cards that also happen to pair well with tokens, which is pretty nice. But the other thing is, I just don't think there's that many good one mana token generators. Even in Historic, that's something that I've noticed is lacking when I'm building token decks. And so getting this as a card that can produce a token on turn one, that even has haste, and then gets you a bonus to play later in the game, makes me think this is a very good card on rate. Obviously, I think this card is much more likely to see play in Alchemy, probably in either a token deck or an adventure deck of some sort, but I do think because there are a real lack of good one-mana token generators that if you are running a token strategy in Historic, you might want to consider this one, even though waiting five mana to get the creature side down does take a long time in a very fast format, obviously. Uh, so next up, we've got Stormkeld Curator, which is another interesting card. So it's another adventure, and you've got this instant side where you can conjure X random cards from its spellbook into your hand. So if we have a look at the spellbook, it's essentially all just auras, right? All that glitters, ethereal armor, curiosity, and stuff like that. And then when you cast it on the creature side for six mana, you can put any number of aura cards from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield attached to it. So 
it is a powerful effect, but I just don't know what deck wants this, right? You could potentially run it a control deck, but you ideally don't want to be tapping out for your big finishes, I don't think. And I feel like, you know, even with the one ring nerf, there are probably better options. I think the ring is probably a better top end even after the nerf. I think you can run, you know, there's the, the horn locked whale that's probably better than this as well. Obviously, if you are running a deck with a bunch of other auras in, then this also has bonus synergy there. You know, maybe you could try and run it if you have powerful auras that you can pitch to the graveyard, but I just don't think the aura synergies are quite there in alchemy. I think there are better top-end finishes for a control deck in alchemy as well. And in historic, this is just way too expensive to see play. So I feel like out of all the cards, this might be the one that I'm missing something on, but it just doesn't really feel like it's good enough to see play in either format to me. It just feels like there are better options or there aren't, there just aren't enough good synergies with the auras for this to be good, I don't think. Uh, then next up we've got Sir Joshua and Sir Saxon, which is another interesting card. So it's a double team card, so you can get another copy in your hand. Typically that's obviously not very good with a legendary card, but you can have two of them in play at the same time. And when you do have both, they both get Battle Cry, which is pretty interesting. Again, I'm not really sure this has a good home. I think, you know, it is a legendary human, so it can potentially fit into something like a Joda deck, but I feel like even after rotation, we have way better options at the two-drop slot, you know. There's a ton of two-drop legendary creatures that are very good at protecting your other creatures, like Hajar and Pippin, for example. So if this does see play, I imagine it will be in the five-color Joda deck, but I have a feeling that we have better options, so I'm not really sure this one sees the cut. And then finally, we've got the only two lands in the set. First of all is Loch Laren, which I'm not really a big fan of. Like, I'm not a big fan of tap lands at all, especially tapped monocolored lands. And then the bonus effect on this is pretty nice. You get to scry three and then, you know, make the opponent's next creature enter the battlefield with stun counters on it and enter tapped as well. But you have to do it during your turn and you can only do it once. So... This just seems awful to me. I don't think there's any deck that would really want this. I mean, it's an interesting design, but like... I just don't ever want to be running, you know, tapped monocolored lands in my deck. If this was an instant speed ability, then I'd be more interested in it. But as things stand, I'm not really interested in this one at all. The other land, though, I think is pretty big. So this is Captivating Crossroads, which, you know, is obviously a callback to Forsaken Crossroads. And this one, I think, is going to be big for alchemy for sure. You know, one of the biggest turning points after rotation in alchemy was that the mana bases became a lot worse. So getting a card like this that can fix your mana a lot better is a really big buff to any of the multicolored decks whether that's a two color deck especially the ones that don't have access to the fast lands or you know five color joda really you know missed out on forsaken crossroads so getting this sort of effect is really nice now obviously i don't think this is as good as forsaken crossroads because you miss out on the scry but as the game goes late even if you did you were on the play this enters uh, untapped and because of just the lack of good lands in the format right now i expect most multicolored decks to be interested in this one so that's the set i'm actually really excited about this you know when they first started spoiling the cards I was kind of pessimistic about it just because with Bow Masters and One Ring as it was, I really didn't expect many of these cards to break through in Alchemy. Now with the nerf, I, I'm way more optimistic that we're going to see a big variety of decks in the format, or at least I really hope so. You know, I really don't want the One Ring to still be a menace in the format. But either way, there's a bunch of cards in this set that I'm really excited to brew with. But more importantly than that, I think the nerfs to Bow Masters and, and One Ring are such a big rejuvenation to both Alchemy and Historic that I really can't wait for this patch to go live and try some new decks out definitely let me know in the comments what your favorite cards from this set and especially if i missed out on anything with these cards because a few of them did feel like they have combo potential that i might have missed out on also definitely let me know what you think about the rebalancing i'm guessing most people are happy with this apart from the lack of refunds on wild cards obviously but that's a conversation for another day but either way definitely let me know in the comments what you think and i'll catch you all in the next one big up